Welcome to Thursdays with Troy. As always, I'm Troy, Troy Lambert, mystery author, editor, and super plotterer, and your host. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Roland Denzel. Roland is a 27-year veteran of printing and publishing industry, an author, a health coach, and a coach to other authors. In 2015, he created The Indestructible Author, which I'm fascinated by, to help authors just like himself be more productive and write more books, all while staying healthy, happy, and sane, uh, which seems like an extremely large task. He is the author of over 10 books, a nutritionist, a restorative exercise specialist, and a speaker. He grew up in Southern California, but now lives in Colorado with his wife and co-author, uh, do you say that, Galena? Is yep. that correct? Where he's experiencing living with with seasons for the first time in his life. Well, congratulations on that. I'm in Idaho, and we have seasons as well, most of them involving road construction. So welcome. Oh, yes. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we, we talk a lot about being productive as a writer, but we all we often don't talk about being happy, healthy, and sane while doing it, which enables us to be more productive. And what does Plotter do to keep you organized and have to do with your health as a writer? So our guest today, fortunately, has all the answers and knows a lot about that. So we're going to dive right in. First, let's talk about author health. And in a sentence or two, kind of define a healthy author and define why you're targeting authors specifically, as opposed to just a general health group. Okay. Well, I am an author, first of all. So I have a <laughs> passion for authors. And, um, and I've seen so many authors over the years sort of succumb to the lifestyle that we live as an author, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you think, how many times have you heard, you know, you have to keep your butt in the chair, right? And if you keep your butt in the chair too much, yeah, you get a lot of words written, but, and maybe a lot of books written, but those, that, those hours, especially when they're hours in a row, sitting with butt in chair, they take a toll on you. Maybe not now, but eventually they will catch up both metabolically and also physically from a posture perspective. It affects the way our, ne our neck is and our breathing um, and our heart, everything. Most authors don't want to, I mean, they want to retire from their day job, but they don't want to retire from being an author. They want to write forever. Right. And um, in order to do that, you have not only have to be physically able to write, with your hands, or if you're dictating, you need to be able to, you know, to, to do that. But you also have to not be in pain because you can't, yeah. you're not, not at your best when you're in pain and your brain has to be sharp. So I'm saying that what you can do <laughs> right. now while you're still healthy goes a long way to reducing your chances of getting those things. The thing to remember is like all of these things that we consider genetic, like, oh, there's, it doesn't mean there's nothing you can do about it. It just means you have a genetic propensity towards it versus somebody who doesn't. Um, so one of the things you talk about in this book and that I, I was fascinated by also is off, authors often suffer from anxiety simply because of the things that we do. It's stressful. You get rejections. You've got deadlines, all those kind of things. Um, tell us how that anxiety impacts both your physical and your mental health. So the mental health is easy. I mean, it's an easier mm -hmm. discussion, right? Right, right. But, but what people don't seem to understand is like, it's not just that, oh, I have anxiety, I'm worried about stuff. But what happens is you can have a low level of anxiety where you don't even necessarily recognize it as, as such. So everyone, we all have a phone, right? A powerful right. phone. But every once in a while, it gets to be like, wow, my phone was so fast and now it's so slow. What is happening? And then you don't realize, oh, there's some program running in the background. And it's it's right. not letting go. It's not letting go. And then eventually you're like, I have to kill that program. Maybe that's not enough because maybe it stole all the memory. And now you have to do what? You got to reset your phone, reboot your phone. And then it comes back up and it feels, it feels great. Our, that's like our brain. So when we have some sort of anxiety. We're usually anxious about something. It's not probably not our writing, but it's bills. It yeah. is my relationship. Um, I miss my family. And we can't, we can try to compartmentalize these things to where we say, I'm just going to focus on this one thing. I'll think about this later. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still brain cycles or CPU cycles spinning in the yeah. background that come up every once in a while and interrupt us, keep us from writing, 
keep us out of that flow state that we want to get in. And they really can impact us short term and long term. That's that's the mental part, right? The physical part is, you know, anxiety can has side effects from the you know perspective where it's raising your blood pressure. It's when you have anxiety, oh, yeah. you get nervous and you get tense. So when you're <laughs> exactly. tensed up, when your muscles are tensed up, you all sorts of things are not flowing. It's not just that your your ideas aren't flowing, but your the fluids in your body, your blood is not flowing the same. It's like in, where the bl blood vessels and arteries are supposed to be gently curving. But when we do that, the muscles tighten up and then you get more constriction or restriction. And that is um, one of the, the the, the things that can cause um, high blood pressure and um, like artery damage, you know, like the mm -hmm. hardening, hardening of the arteries and right. that constricts, hardens, and then you have the kind of things that we don't want to have. Wow. Yeah. Especially as writers that sit all day, those type of things. Um, so, so let's look at your, I'm going to look at your plotter file uh, for your book that's called uh, The Author Brain. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is food. Although I may not, <laughs> mine too. Uh, although I may not like it quite the quite the same when my doctor talks to me about it. So tell us a little bit about food and diet and how that impacts you from the author healthy author perspective. Okay, there's like a spectrum. So a lot of people think of when um, when they think of food, they think of their weight. Let's say an author is overweight. It's not that you can't be healthy when you're overweight, but a lot of people who are overweight are not healthy. And mm -hmm. that can lead to not being comfortable. Um, a lot of my, I'm a health coach as well as an author, right? So, and a lot of my clients who are overweight, they have issues with, um, they've got issues, you know, so they're not always feeling their best. And a lot of that is because of overeating. And a lot of that is also because of eating the wrong things that are not really fitting with them. Um, and so all of those things, it's similar to like the anxiety. If you're not feeling well, it's hard to write your best. If you are like, I, I lost 110 pounds. I was, this is 18 years ago. I was very overweight and sitting there was uncomfortable and I couldn't sit for very long. I also couldn't stand for very long. So I would be moving around. I was never particularly comfortable. And, um, yeah, luckily I wasn't a writer back then, but I was an IT guy, but I, it, def, it did affect me. There's no yeah. PTO. My boss never gives me time off since I work for myself. Oh, I was Go just ahead. gonna mention, so that's the part about the weight, but then there's the health aspects. Uh, so if you're thinking of, we've all heard of type one diabetes, which is the kind where you usually get when you're young and you're insulin dependent. And you get it young because of an autoimmune condition or something like that. We don't know exactly, but that's that's the gist of it. Type two is the one that you tend to develop because of insulin resistance, usually caused by diet, stress, and inflammation. And then there's another one that's not officially called type three diabetes, but it's that's the Alzheimer's disease we talked about. And there's a ton of evidence that nutrition and stress, but nutrition particularly has a plays a huge role in this. Eating like a lot amount of lots of sugar, high amount of carbs. Like once your body is having a struggle with sugar and high amounts of carbohydrates, then it causes inflammation and stress within the body that then uh, affects your blood sugar spikes, and that causes a lot of this damage, the striations in the brain that can lead to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of doctors are calling this type three diabetes and just eating too much and too much of the wrong things and not enough of the right things can lead to inflammation that you might feel most obviously like in your fingers, let's say you have a oh, yeah. tendency towards arthritis, but can also lead to systemic inflammation, which can lead to, you know, irritability. But there's so many things um, that chronic inflammation can cause, even either really dramatically or just on a lower level and be a, a heavy contributor towards your health issues. Tightening up your diet can help you lose weight, sharpen the mind, keep you healthy longer, and uh, help you heal faster. Let's say you have an injury, all of these things, all of these things that are important to everybody, but it's as an author, it's part of your livelihood.
Right, exactly. And that's a beautiful segue because it leads it it leads me to my next question, which is kind of in this, obviously we can't cover the whole book. You guys are going to have to buy it, but I know I'm going to um, because I, I can tell you that uh, struggling with health is not new to most of us. So you talk about snacks and cravings. And this is one thing a lot of times when a writer is sitting there writing, you're munching on something. Usually it's not carrot sticks and celery. So talk to us about, you know, snacks and cravings. Talk to us about those two things. Okay. It's so interesting that you brought that up because when, have you ever done NaNoWriMo? Yes. Yes. So if you're ever in like one of those NaNoWriMo prep groups, people are like the, like the week before, I've got my drawer full of snacks ready and I've got my, I mean, yep. I mean, depends on where you're hanging out, but sometimes though, I've got my 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 under the desk refrigerator full of Mountain Dew, and like all Ooh. these things, right? That are just like, yeah. so they're doing two things. A, they want the sugar to give them the energy and the focus to keep going, and they also don't want to get up when they get hungry, right? Yep. And both of those things are bad because sugar is a vicious circle. You mm -hmm. take sugar, yes, it does give you energy because it's calories and it's fast calories. So it does give you energy, but then there's the crash and then that makes cravings for more sugar and more snacks. So all these things, that's, that's the one thing. The other thing is not getting up from your desk, not getting up from yes. your desk t tells your body met metabolically speaking that it's like it's rest time. So yeah. your, your brain starts to relax because historically speaking, humans when they're resting it was time it's like le legitimately time to rest right when they're sitting down right. or laying down that's time to rest and our bodies are still in tune with how they were thousands of years ago so when you do this it slows your metabolism down so there have been studies that show that merely getting up for five minutes every 30 minutes can lower your blood sugar by 20 percent increase insulin sensitivity by 20%. Doctors have found that just asking them to do this, five, it's not five minutes of exercise, it's just five minutes of not sitting, five minutes of moving around, yeah. has had a dramatic effect on that without doing really anything else. So that's good wow. news. Yeah, and the best news from my perspective, I mean, I, I'm fine with exercising for five minutes, but like most people are not gonna like drop and do push ups every 30 minutes. So this is just get up, walk around the house, check your email, like on your phone, put on a podcast and walk, go get a cup of coffee, use the bathroom, all sorts of things. That's the kinds of things that we are resist trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to drop and do a bunch of burpees. It's fine. Just, just get up and move around. That's, that's, that's right. There is a point in the book where you talk about whether you're a food panster or a food plotter. So let's, <laughs> let's just chat about that for a little bit and what that means and what kind of what that looks like. Okay. So I don't know. I'm not going to say that all my metaphors, my writing metaphors <laughs> are perfect when it comes to, <laughs> to, to nutrition, but I try to do things that authors will, you know, that will resonate. We're all familiar, familiar with plotting and pantsing when it comes to our novels. A plotter when it comes to nutrition would be, I make a, a meal plan for my week. Um, here's all the meals I'm going to have. I work backwards. Now I have to make a, a shopping list. What day do I need to, am I going to do batch cooking? That's going to be on Sunday. So therefore I need, it's like this whole thing working back. And that works very well for people who like to do that. Right. But then at the other extreme, there are the pantsers. It's, it helps to have some sort of a structure. Like you don't just sit down there and write a whole, write the whole book straight through without having some sort of subconscious or conscious plan that you're following even if it's not this very 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 specific steps this scene comes after this and this scene comes after that and you can do the same thing with food as long as you have some sort of a system if you stock your house with the kind of foods and snacks that you know are going to be healthy and they can be paired together in pleasing combinations right then right. You don't have much to worry about, but it, that takes, that's a different sort of planning. What, what plotter, what pantsers don't tell you is that subconsciously they're still plotting, right? Yes. But, but they're just, yeah. they're freestyling it. They have absorbed it. They know how it's going and they're doing it. And you can do the same thing with your food as well. As long as, as you, 
Yeah. As long as you have that underlying plan, which is kind of one of the things we talk about with discovery writers as well, is you you probably have an underlying plan, an idea of where you're going, mm -hmm. even if you don't have an exact roadmap to get there. So yeah. that's actually, that's a, a very, very good point. Um, so let's talk just for just briefly about supplements. Yes, no, maybe. Do writers need them? What does that look like? Well, most writers don't need supplements, but that doesn't mean that they're not a, that, that they can't be valuable. The one that comes to, the, the couple that come to mind that I recommend people start with right away um, is um, if you don't get enough, if you have trouble getting enough protein in your diet, then a protein right. powder is a great way, like a protein shake kind of a thing is a great way to get supplement. Fish oil is a great one. Omega-3 is like fish oil, salmon, that kind of thing. It's the, that healthy fat that's there. It's also in krill and in some sort of algae. So if, even if you're a, a vegan or a vegetarian, there's a, there's a supplement it. you can get. Yep. Um, then the omega-6s on the flip side are something that most of us get too much of. And, and it's not that they're unhealthy, but they're unhealthy in the amount and in the balance that we're getting. We, because they're ubiquitous and we're, they're not supposed to be ubiquitous. So this is corn oil, canola oil, um, soybean oil. They have a lot of omega-6s in it and very little omega-3s. And when that, our body gets that imbalance, things tend to go a little bit wonky in the inflammation department. Before we... Um wrap at least this part of the discussion up. Uh, let's talk about sleep. Cause I love this little comment that you have down here. Um, we'll just show your plotter fire where it says sleep, LOL, like you're going to listen to me. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about sleep for just a minute. Okay. This is a fact, true fact, true fact about sleep. So what I found was when you mention sleep in your email, people just unsubscribe like it's nobody's business. And it's because, uh, 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 and I talked to my friend, um, Dr. Mike T. Nelson, who's a, a sleep researcher. And he said, it's because when you ask people to sleep more, you're asking them to fundamentally change their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse than asking them to go gluten-free, right? Uh, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's like really hard, right? And there, and it's because there's so many psychological things to this. And, you know, I can, you know, I would, I could go all into this whole thing, but there's but there's a thing where we feel that when we're late at night, this is our time. We just had a hard day. I deserve oh, to yeah. be able to watch this or read this or stay up, or this is when I do my best writing. It doesn't really matter. We convince ourselves that this is our best time. But what happens is there's a thing called decision fatigue that mm -hmm. happens because we make thousands of tiny little micro decisions and some major ones throughout the day. So decision fatigue makes it very easy to take the easy way out, the easy decision. So what happens is that's what happens late at night. So if like you've already done this and you're already like, I've had a hard day. I deserve to be able to watch this. So you're in this, it's called revenge bedtime procrastination. I did not coin this uh, term, but I thought, but I think it's amazing. I like revenge it. bedtime procrastination. And so we we say, I deserve this. I had a hard day. My family's all asleep. Finally, I have some alone time. I'm going to do what I want to do. No one's going to fight me for the remote, whatever. And so we stay up late. And then as a result, our writing, our work, whatever creativity, whatever suffers the next day, which makes fatigue even worse that next day. And then it's like a, it's a, a, vicious, cycle. a vicious circle. So what happens is because you're your when you say when I say Troy, I want you to go to bed early tonight. You're going to say like, <laughs> you know, that's my only time. You know, I yeah. I don't believe that that's the case. Yeah, so people just don't want to hear it. But I do want to have. I mean, there will be some people who will want to hear it. And the good news is that I don't. I very rarely tell anybody you just have to sleep more. What I do is I want you to sleep differently. I want you to shift more towards your natural circadian rhythm. So go to bed earlier and get up later. You know, you don't have to, yeah. if you sleep, only sleep, if you do best on five hours, still get your five hours, just shift it. Just shift your shift, time. Shift it and you'll do better. And then there's a couple things you can do throughout the day to make what the sleep you do get even better. Yeah. That is excellent. 
All right. I cannot wait to read this book. Actually, I'm going to have to go sign up right after this. Um, so, but let's do a, a really quick wrap up here. So tell us, tell us just a little bit more about the indestructible author. Uh, you still got indestructibleauthor.com. I'm assuming that's, mm -hmm. your, that's your website. That's where you're doing yep. everything. Um, and what can people find there? And uh, what, what's, uh, what's going to help authors by going there? So when you go there, you can get a lot of tips and tricks about how to optimize your productivity. And there's some articles that I've written there about this whole, you know, 30 minutes on, five minutes off type of thing. You might be familiar with the Pomodoro method. Yes. Right? So yes. as an amazing coincidence, this 30 minute period works great. So it's dual duty, right? You can right. not only be a healthier author, a more productive, and a more productive author by just doing this at the same time. Because this, the science, the science of the Pomodoro is one thing, but then the science of the, the blood sugar and the moving, you know, five minutes every 30 minutes, they just happen to come together in a perfect harmony here. So you can do both of those things. You can be more productive and healthier at the same time. So there's some articles like that. And there's also a couple about how to optimize your, your nutrition for your writing, some productivity tricks, um, and also ergonomics. Um, you, oh, you mentioned yes. er, you know, so I'm a, a restorative exercise specialist. So I um, talk a lot about, you know, standing desks. I'm at a standing desk or a sit stand desk right now. It kind of goes up and down. And yep, me too. Great. Coincidentally, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's just so many things that we can do that we can just work into our lifestyle. That once they become a habit, they're going to keep us writing better, more, more words, and feeling better doing it. So tell us what other resources have helped you get where you are today. So what resources have kind of brought you to, you know, the, to writing this book and where you're at today? as an author it was a combination of when i lost the weight that wasn't enough to keep me as healthy as i wanted to be i wanted to continue to be able to do these things i wanted to be a writer and write forever so i started doing more research i became a nutritionist through precision nutrition and oh, wow. restorative exercise which has helped me a lot um you know my friend is the Katie Bowman, she runs a, from the Nutritious Movement Center, and she oh, trained, yeah. trains restorative exercise specialists. And that's taught me so much about like, moving more often versus just moving or moving more. The things that I thought about exercise are, were wrong. So I'm thinking more about movement versus exercise and more about nutrition versus diet and more about habits and building a lifestyle that enables us to be healthy rather than be healthy to support this lifestyle. Oh, so gotcha. Yeah. So it's more about habits and systems that you can put in place, which is great for authors because the more systems you have in place, the less time you have to think about it. And the more you get to think about your characters and your plots and your Exactly. Whatever. Exactly. Being organized in your life and in your writing life, in your regular life and your writing life, both have huge productivity advantages, of course. Absolutely. So uh, if you've seen Thursdays with Troy before, you've seen there's a question of the day. Um, and for you, though, this question is both musical and food related. So are you ready for your question? Mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to morning smooth uh, fruit smoothies, should we have the Prince smoothie, which we will call the raspberry puree, or the Beatles, the strawberry fields forever? What would be your choice? Strawberries have a lot of things that are good, going good for them, but they have been bred to be um, big and, if you've probably noticed, relatively tasteless. And yes. raspberries are not as sweet and they have a different taste. They're like, you know, they're good. Like, but like, yeah. you know, they're not as, um, you know, you know, there's so many more like polyphenols and antioxidants you're going to get in a raspberry um, or other berries than you would get in a, get in a strawberry. So I'm going to say raspberries, the raspberry Excellent. puree. And I love prints. So. Yeah. I just had to, of course it had to be done. Um, and I love it. Actually, that's what my doctor tells me about certain berries as well. And strawberries are not top on the 
on his favorite list for me. Well, thanks everyone for joining us on Thursdays with Troy. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yourself and we really, in, in this one especially, hope you learned a lot. And of course, there's a lot more to learn. Uh, so I'm gonna you know, invite you to join, to, to check out Roland's site um, and to look at Indestructible Author uh, because I know all of us wanna write and keep writing forever. I never plan to retire, at least not from writing. So, um, and you can always tag one of us in the group if you think we might have the answer you're looking for. So see you next Thursday for another Thursdays with Troy. Thanks everybody. Everybody, thanks for having me, Troy. Thank you.